In a top secret operation in the 1950s, codenamed MKUltra, the CIA administered a powerful drug called LSD to US citizens without their knowledge. And the purpose of the study was to see if LSD could be used as a type of weapon to control people's minds. And I know this sounds like a movie script or some sort of dystopian novel, but it actually happened. And to me, this is a perfect case study and starting point to examine ethics in psychology research. All right, guys, welcome to Psych Explained. In this video, we're going to discuss ethics. And at its core, ethics and psychology research is the understanding that participants in a study have certain rights. And it's the researcher's responsibility to make decisions with the participants' rights in mind. Now, these rights are typically laid out as guidelines or principles that were developed by the American Psychological Association, commonly known as the APA. And the ones we're going to talk about today include informed consent, protection from harm, deception, freedom from coercion, debriefing, and confidentiality slash anonymity. And as we talk about these principles, we're going to refer back to Project MK Ultra and see which ethical principles were violated and which ones were upheld. So let's get started. So before a study begins, there should be some sort of mutual understanding between the researchers and the participants regarding what's about to happen. And this essentially lays the foundation for what we refer to as informed consent. And if we break down these two terms, you'll understand what informed consent means. Informed means to be made aware of, right? You're informing somebody about what's about to happen and consent means to agree. So the participants know what's about to happen and they agree to do it, some sort of signed document. And if we break this down into bullet point form, here is kind of the main takeaways. First, informed consent must occur before the study begins. So not during the study, not after the study, participants should know what the study is about before they actually enter the research study. Also, and most importantly, is that participation should be voluntary. Okay, what it should be, it should be voluntary, right? Voluntary participation, as opposed to the opposite, which would be involuntary participation, right? They should choose and willingly enter the study without being, let's say, forced to do it. And also with voluntary participation is they also should have the opportunity to withdraw or leave the study at any time, right? So if you're a participant and you say, yeah, I don't wanna be here anymore, right? This makes me uncomfortable, I hate being here. Well, the researcher can't say, well, well, you signed the signed document, you have to stay. If they want to leave, they want to withdraw, that is part of informed consent. Also with informed consent, knowing this is before the study begins, participants should be made aware of the purpose of the study, right? Why are we here, right? What, is we, what are we hoping to achieve by me signing up for the study? And even things like logistics, you know, how long am I going to be here? What do I have to do? Am I taking a survey? So what are the logistics and purpose as well? And lastly, participants should be made aware of the risks involved. You know, will I be harmed in any way? Will I feel anxious? Will I feel stressed? So informed consent is all about voluntary participation. A participant knows what they're about to get into, and then the study begins. So here's a question. How does it connect to our study of Project MK Ultra? Now, just to recap, and this is a true story, the CIA purposely bought the world's supply of LSD to be used as kind of an experimental truth serum, kind of a mind controlling drug to see if it can actually work against, let's say an enemy. Okay, I know it sounds like just dystopian novel, but it actually happened. Now, did the participants know they were being given LSD? Most of them did not. So what would that tell you? That broke informed consent. There was no informed consent. There was no voluntary participation. So under each one, we'll explain how this connects to let's say Project MKUltra, which is that People, right, they weren't participants because they didn't sign up for anything. These human subjects, people, uh, uh, were not aware, right? We're not aware, aware they were given, they were given LSD, right? So it's not just that they were not aware that they were given LSD. They also didn't even know they were in a study in the first place. 
a lot of them just went to brothels or a lot of them went to different places and somebody just slipped a drug inside and they didn't even know what was happening, okay? All right, so there's informed consent. All right, what's next? We have protection from harm. And to me, this is the most important one. No matter what research study you're doing, you really have one goal, right? You, obviously your goal is to you know, advance scientific literature, but it's to make sure that nobody in your study is harmed. Now it's impossible to have no harm at all, right? You know, you're gonna feel stress, a participant might feel anxious, you can't control that. So it's not about eliminating you know, all harm. The idea of this is you really want to minimize harm, right? Minimize harm as much as possible. But understand harm, comes in many forms, right? Harm can be physical, right? An electric shock, uh, blood pressure goes up, right? There's something physically harmed with the participants. Another type of harm you wanna minimize is probably the most damning in terms of long-term effects, which is psychological harm, right? This would be like emotional distress and, and all those type of things. So we want to minimize the harm. Now here's the big question. How much harm is acceptable if you're doing a really good study, right? And a lot of this is subjective, right? Yes, people, participants might have some harm, but you can make an argument, well, it's for the betterment of scientific research, right? So it's okay to harm a little bit if the benefits outweigh the costs. And this is sometimes referred to as cost benefit or risk benefit, cost benefit, benefit analysis, which is essentially saying, analysis. You know, do the pros outweigh the cons, right? Just use your hand, right? Pros outweigh the cons. And once again, it's quite subjective, but you have to make that argument. If I use my little drawing here, you have to make the argument that the benefits of the study outweigh the risks, right? The benefits outweigh the risks. And if you can argue the benefits outweigh the risks that we're, we're advancing scientific knowledge, we're learning so much, and yes, people might suffer a little bit, well, then it might be worth it, okay? All right, so let's go back to our study of Project MK Ultra. Were people harmed? Absolutely. Now, some people take LSD for recreational purposes, right? Because they want to, it's fun in their minds and it creates a euphoric experience. But imagine me giving this hallucinogenic drug, but you didn't know you took it. So there's so much harm being inflicted on these participants or people who didn't know they were taking it. So in this study, there is a lot of harm. There was no protection from harm. There was tons of distress. Uh, and we kind of lay out, you know, a, a couple of this idea of distress, emotional distress. There was, you know, fear, right? Why am I feeling the way I do, right? They didn't know they were taking LSD and, and anxiety, uh, fear, anxiety, and panic, uh, and even hallucinations, right? It's a strong hallucinogenic drug. So there was a lot of uh, distress and discomfort and fear and anxiety that occurred. Uh, there was absolutely no protection from harm. Okay, what's our third one? Our third one is deception. Now this one is a little interesting because deception can be used, but only in certain circumstances. But let's actually dive into what deception actually means. So deception, you know, a synonym, means to mislead, okay? Mislead, okay? Or you might say, you know, to hide the truth. Hide the truth, okay? And it's important to note that sometimes deception is used and it is important, right? There are a lot of famous studies, and we'll talk about these in a moment, where you have to kind of hide the truth or, or to mislead participants because it's just part of the study and without it, you're not gonna get the results you need. You know, just for example, some very famous studies in psychology that have used deception are like Milgram shock experiments and you're more than welcome to research Milgram shock experiment, but the participants didn't know that the equipment was fake and they didn't know that they were not really electrocuting the other participants. You could of course look that up. And another famous study is the ASH conformity study, right? In which participants were led to believe that, uh, you know, everybody around them were part of the study, but everybody around them were really part of the research team. They were called confederates. A confederate is somebody who pretends to be part of a study, but they're really part of the research team. So generally speaking, according to the APA, deception is really not allowed, okay? But it is allowed, okay? So we'll say, you know, deception, you know, is permitted, is allowed, is allowed 
if, okay, if. And what is that if? Once again, cost-benefit analysis. If you can prove that one, nobody's really being harmed, right? You can kind of eliminate that after the study, but also that the, the benefits outweigh, that you're advancing scientific literature that is really important for the scientific and psychological community, that deception is, is meaningful for the study. So in general, we don't wanna mislead our participants, but sometimes you do if the benefits outweigh the costs. So was anybody misled or was there hiding the truth in our project MK Ultra? Well, there was a lot of it. In one big example, participants were led to believe that they were taking an experimental drug to treat schizophrenia. What they didn't tell them was that it was LSD, and they took this drug every single day for a year, right? So that's an extreme example of deception. Another example of, let's say, you know, misleading or hiding the truth is that a lot of the studies took place at a brothel, and a brothel is where prostitutes and sex workers work, and they would lure men in, and the men didn't realize is that the prostitutes were working for the CIA and they would slip LSD in their drink and then they would be interrogated, right? What do you know and, and how does this LSD make you feel? So in our study, you know, coming back to Project MK Ultra, where is deception is that the prostitutes in the brothels, the sex workers, workers, were actually Confederates. They were part of the research team helping out the CIA. Right. So there are a lot of examples of deception. This is not one that would be good. All right, so what's another APA ethical principle? We have coercion. Now, the same way we broke down deception, let's break down coercion. To coerce, right, as a verb, and coerce essentially means to force or pressure someone, pressure someone, to do something against their will, right? They don't want to do it but they're being unwittingly forced involuntarily to do something. This is why we often say freedom from coercion, right? Freedom from being forced to do something against your will. And this might be in a research study. It could be just being in a study, you know, be in a study. I don't want to be here, but I'm going to make you be here anyways, right? Take this bill. Or it could be something like just uh, staying in a study, right? Maybe you want to leave, but they won't let you leave. So there's a lot of coercion. It could be also saying or do something that you don't want to do. Now, how would a researcher coerce somebody to do something, right? How would that actually happen? Well, typically, it deals with threats, okay? Some sort of threats. Now, threats do not have to be, you know, somebody puts a gun to your head. It doesn't have to be so obvious. A threat could be somebody uses their power, right? The CIA is a pretty powerful agency, their power or influence over you. Or maybe if they threaten you by saying, if you don't do X, I will do Y. So there's a lot of coercion that takes place. So how would this apply to Project MK Ultra? Well, people were threatened that if they didn't do what the CIA wanted them to do, there would be consequences. So in one big example, I'm gonna write this down here. Uh, people were threatened, threatened, threatened to extend their trip. Let me explain what this means. People did not realize that they were given LSD. And when they were being interrogated to see how the drug was affecting them, the CIA officials might have said something like, if you don't follow or listen to our directions, we're gonna make your psychedelic trip worse. We're gonna give you more LSD. Now realize they didn't even know what was happening. They didn't know they were taking LSD. So if somebody tells you, you know, we're gonna threaten you and make this, this trip, this bad experience worse, that would be a form of coercion, all right? Another way you could think about this of coercion is that some of the people who were given uh, LSD were mentally ill or drug addicts. In other words, they weren't in the right state of mind to one, give informed consent, but they were being pressured to do something because they didn't know otherwise. They weren't in the right state of mind and they were pressured by the influence and power of these people. All right, so what are our last two? Let's talk about debriefing. Now we know informed consent occurs before a study begins. What about debriefing? Debriefing is the opposite. It occurs after the study ends, okay? And what is the point of debriefing? There's a lot of things that happen in a study. And debriefing is the opportunity 
for the researchers to really let it all out, right? Here's what we did, here's why we did it. Do you have any questions? Participants can ask questions and you know seek advice or seek help. This is where all the things happen to make sure that everything is cool, everything is calm after the study ends. And if we break it down, this occurs once after the study. Uh, participants might explain once again the purpose of the study. You know, here's what we did and why we did it. They may also reveal any deception. Okay, so yes, you were deceived, but here's why we did it. And then lastly, you know, do you have any questions? You know, do you have any questions about the study or the data or why we're here? Uh, the questions could also be in the, long, in the long lines of, you know, I don't really feel good, right? I feel anxious, why do I feel anxious? And it's at this opportunity where it's the researcher's responsibility to return people to kind of a normal baseline from before the study began. Right? If a participant is feeling anxious or stressed, during the debriefing session, is the researcher needing to calm them down and making sure that you know, if you need any extra help, what do you need? How can I help you if there are any issues? Okay. Now, how could this apply to our Project MK Ultra? And by the way, please research this, this operation. It is absolutely fascinating. And once again, it sounds like a dystopian novel, but it actually happened. Of course, there was no debriefing, right? It wasn't like, you know, here's why we gave you LSD and have a nice day, right? There was absolutely no follow-up, right? Not how you doing. Hey, by the way, we gave you LSD three months ago. How you doing, right? There was none of that. It was just kind of, here you go. Go without your merry way and we'll see you later, okay? All right, so what's our last ethical principle? We have confidentiality and anonymity. And what both of these have in common is about participants' rights. Participants have certain rights. Now, what are these rights? Well, let's break down what these two terms mean, confidentiality and anonymity, starting with anonymity. And you might have heard of the word anonymous which is essentially saying the same thing, which is we don't know who the participants are, right? We don't know your name, we don't know your address, we don't know your social security number. You're just a data point, you're just a number in our study, right? In other words, if you ever fill out a survey, people don't know who you are, you just gave information, right? That's anonymity. But if you're in a study and you have to give information, you have to make sure that you keep that information private. Right? We don't want the name Dr. Kushner out there in the public if I participate in a research study and there's maybe some controversial or very you know, private results. So we have keeping information private and not really knowing who we are. So participants have rights. Those rights are, they have the rights to privacy, okay? And to keep information, you know, if you have to actually do give your name, to keep the information, in a secure environment, in a secure environment, okay? That might be, for example, keeping the information in a database, in a computer that nobody can get a hold of, right? It's not going on Facebook, it's not going on social media, no one has access to this information. So the whole point of this box is privacy, uh, security, and making sure that we protect our participants. So how does confidentiality and anonymity connect to our project MK Ultra? Was there a breach of confidentiality and anonymity? Well, at first they did a really good job because they didn't want the public to know what would happen, right? They did a really good job securing the names of the people who took the drugs. But over time, as you see this headline from Washington Post, the information eventually got out. Right, this covert operation was made public and the public was horrified that this actually occurred. And if you look at this today and you want to go online and look up MKUltra, you can actually see the people, or at least some of the people, who were given the drugs. A lot of them are pretty famous. Some of them are like Whitey Bulger, who is the Boston crime boss and mobster. Uh, Ken Kesey, the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. There are a lot of famous people who are part of these trials. So yes, there might have been some privacy, but unfortunately, is their identities, 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 uh, were not kept secure. Right, because we know today who was in the study, okay? So yeah, maybe it was private first, but today we do know. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I really hope you learned something. Now, it's important to know 
the APA is not the only organization in the world to protect participants' rights or have some sort of code of ethics. We also have the Institutional Review Board, or the IRB, and they exist in research labs and they exist on college campuses and universities. And when you do a study, you submit your proposal to them and this committee will determine if essentially the pros outweigh the cons, right? Is there any risk to participants? So there are a lot of things out there that protect the rights of participants. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.